right, welcome to Live Splaining with <laughs> Father Bonaventure and Father Joseph Anthony Cress. Um, Howdy. I want to make, uh, we, uh, Father Joseph Anthony, how are you doing? <laughs> oh, just peachy. Just peachy this day. That's great. That's great. We're all excited to have you here. Um, so this is, as you can tell, if you're uh, tuning in on Live Splaining, um, this is what I would call the Backbenchers edition. Um, yeah. So yeah. Uh, Father, Joseph, Father Joseph Anthony and I are not normally, well... You know, the it's usually Father Patrick or Father Gregory or Father Jacob Bertrand. Those are the kind of you know you could say the big guns. Um, and yeah, here we are. They lead the uh, doing, lead the charge. They do, they do. But um, they're all busy doing other things. So um, here we are, and Father Joseph Anthony and I are uh, you know bringing up the rear in a way, but hopefully we'll provide something exciting. Um, so live splitting as if those who are familiar with it and those who are watching along, what you do is uh, we're going to talk about a topic first for a little bit. Uh, mm -hmm. bat around. I'm going to make some philosophical comments uh, as usual. And then um, we'll kick it over to any of the questions. So if you want right now, if you have any questions about anything, we're the topic we're talking about is, is St. John Paul II. But if you have any topics so or questions about JP2, about any sort of thing, we're happy to talk about that. Um, or anything else that you have, but they just put them in the comments screen. We'll we'll play, we'll play. Uh, bring them up on the screen if I remember how to do this and we'll answer them and we'll have a good time. Hopefully the hour will fly by quickly. <laughs> if you don't have questions, then Father Joseph Anthony are just going to talk about stuff. So yeah. anyway. We're good at that, top, I think. Yeah, I'll always try. Our topic today is uh, John Paul II and his legacy, you could say. And there's a okay. lot to be said about that. So I yeah. imagine that uh, even the questions in the comments, people might be interested in saying what, what they, asking what questions they think are important about JP2 and his legacy. Um, now I am not a uh, I'm a not I'm not a JP2 Catholic. There was a phrase there JP2 Catholics. I'm a B16 Catholic. I came into I lost your audio for a second. I think are we good? Okay. Yeah, yeah, I got you All back. Right. Everyone wasn't quite sure if that was me on All on right. my this end is, or not. As we said before, um, this is the uh, these are the backbenchers. But is this can, can people hear me now? Am I good to yes, go? Yes, I got you. I got you. Fantastic. Okay. So what I wanted to say is, um, I'm not a I am not a JP2 Catholic, but I love him, and mm -hmm. uh, and I want to talk about one book that I read uh, my first like experience with John Paul II, I guess. Because I did, when I was in Oxford, I did my um, moral theology paper. You write papers on specific topics there on John Paul II and marriage, indissolubility of marriage. And a book mm. that I just found absolutely fascinating and, and still love and recommend is this book, Love and Responsibility. <laughs> there he is. Uh, he's right here. Okay. Right there. Uh, on I've thought about using this for marriage prep, um, but it's, uh, I don't know if you've read it, Father Joseph Anthony, but yes, I have. What it's, I think it's a tremendous, tremendous account. Theology of the Body, his oh. Wednesday Catechesis, are mm -hmm. in a sense like condensed in this. This was written before. It's in 1957, I think. Mm -hmm. And what's beautiful about John Paul II is what's found at the end of, so the Matthew's Gospel, with the end of the first five sections of it, it says this. This is Matthew, Matthew uh, 13, 51. Uh, Jesus says, have you understood all these things? He's been teaching like the new Moses. And they said to him, yes. And he said to them, therefore, every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who brings out of his treasure what is new and what is old. And what I think was amazing about John Paul II is he was able to, to bring out from the treasures of the church, the faith, uh, what was both old and traditional, and also but what was new, and adds to that, in a sense, that flavoring. And Love and Responsibility, what's beautiful about that book, and beautiful about John Paul II's Theology of the Body, which I think most people are familiar with, is that he comes onto the scene when the Catholic Church and its ch teachings on sexuality is at least confused or i mean people are confused about it and there's struggles about it and instead of going the traditional route of talking about kind of form and function and natural law and sort of things john which is fine jp2 takes up a tradition of phenomenology which he was trained in and he looks at looking at instead of the object like what an act is he looks at the act itself and sees if he can derive you could say the elements of the catholic teaching from the act what act the act of love so the love and responsibility is a an, an examination 
of what it means to love someone, mm -hmm. to love someone. And he looks at just looking at the act in the way that phenomenologists, that they want to know an object, they don't look at the object first, but look at the act of knowing it and then develop accounts of the object. JP2 says, if we look at the act of loving another person, what we'll find is that constitutive elements, that you can't actually have an act of love without it being indissoluble and without being entirely given to one person and without being free from contraception, this sort of thing, right? So he, from the, just the act, without any question about natural law, without any question about the traditional, kind of thing, he just says, if you know what the act of love is, to say, I love you to another person, and then you start to tease out what that means, you'll be able to find out that you can't say that unless you mean, I love you forever, for as long as I'm alive, so indissolubility that there's this, that you can only do it to one person in this mm -hmm. in this way, in this full embodied way, and that in doing it, you hand over everything you have. So in this is the contraception kind of thing. So he says, look, humani vitae that says that you we don't allow uh, natural in, you know, uh, contraception that you can't hold back from giving oneself. He says that's exactly what's just entailed with the act of love. If you're giving yourself entirely, then contraception, the Catholic teachings, which initially sounded like this kind of arcane, medieval science uh, sort of thing, <laughs> right, is actually just a part of the structure of saying I love you and the act of loving. And so he's, he makes this bold claim and then spends his pontificate working this out, especially in the theology of the body, that mm -hmm. Catholics— in the elements of the Catholic teaching, which people thought are old fashioned and prudish and kind of need to be updated. If you don't have these, then you can't actually f have an act of love. You can't actually love someone in the fullest way. And he gets that just from looking at the act of loving. I think that's a profound thing of both new and old that he takes mm -hmm. a new way of the phenomenological method, you could say, of mm -hmm. looking at structures of consciousness and how we actually <laughs> love, but brings out of it the treasures of the old, the church's traditional teaching on marriage, the family, sexuality, and someone's identity, and then love and a gift. And that's that's always struck me as just as one reflection of a profound thing. So if if you have not read Love and Responsibility, um, I do I do encourage you. It's a beautiful it's a beautiful book. But oh, Joseph Fancy, before we kick it over to questions, what do you have to yeah. say about JP? What's yeah. your JP two kind of experience? I mean, so much of what you were talking about, like it's. It's a it's a teaching. It's an articulation of this kind of core understanding and something that's really um, elementary to I think our Catholic faith and understanding the the human person is understanding who we are um, and how we love, and that's what love and responsibility like dives into. And um, when you talked about like doing uh, using it for marriage prep, I mean, there's so much there you can use for for marriage prep. I don't think you can just drop that book onto an engaged couple's desk. Like it might be a little uh, shooting too high on that. Um, oh, sure. But definitely those those teachings as as you articulate them are exactly what we teach in marriage prep. I mean, it's it's how I structure my marriage preps um, are are based upon JP 2s teachings of that kind of exclusivity and fidelity of marriage, the uh, the total gift of self that is entailed by making that act um the con the the openness to life um and that it, it entails all of those parts we um as a campus ministry here we took our fall retreat this year and decided to do an entire retreat just on the theology of the body uh, we had Bill Donahue in, wow. who's uh, from the Theology of the Body Institute in Philadelphia, who it would be a great guest. Maybe we'll pull him on for a guest planning mm -hmm. episode sometime soon. It would yeah. be wonderful. But as he was given this retreat, he uh, he used this line that JP2 talked about. He said that, uh, and he's quoting JP2, but JP2 said that, I fell in love with human love. Mm-hmm. And I think mm -hmm. that like th that shows the understanding of JP2 and why he cares so much, why he wrote this big book, Love and Responsibility, um, back in the 50s, that like there was something enticing, but he fell in love with the way that human beings love each other, how they give each other, give themselves to each other, how they receive, how it's reciprocal. And then in this great mystery, in this kind of like cosmic dance, we are invited into doing the same kind of give and take total self gift with God himself. 
and he enters into that equation because he gives himself to us in this total self gift as well. Mm. And so now it becomes this much more dynamic understanding and like very important to understand then how do we as human beings offer and receive love? And that's that understanding. And when you can understand that, that's part of our humanity, our, you know, incarnate reality then you can start to understand things like marriage. And when you talk about uh, bringing the old and the new, I mean, this is a time, in, you kind of you kind of mentioned it at the beginning, but I mean, this is the time where society was like, oh, we've learned so much from science. Look, we understand mm -hmm. so much now. We need to update. Like, this is just old, archaic, because these were this was for stupid people who didn't know science. But now that we know science, we can change how we approach uh, marriage, how we can mm -hmm. approach um, reproduction uh, in, within the context of marriage and these types of things. And John Paul II was this, I mean, prophetic voice to look at the very act of love and say, well, actually it's written within the act itself. This isn't nothing that it was, now we understand more because of science. It's always been there and always will be because it's written within the act of human love itself. And there's nothing you can do to erase that, to change the font of it, to change the text of it. Like it's, it's, it's part and parcel of the act itself. And that, that cannot change. And he does such a great job with love and responsibility. And then, like you said, kind of re-articulating and even taking it deeper through those Wednesday audiences of um, that became the theology of the body. But um, yeah, I think that's, that's his hmm. beautiful legacy. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's one, it's certainly one of the, I mean, there's so much legacy with him, of course, and we'll get yeah. to the questions in a second, but um, I mean, in a sense, bringing the church Vatican II to, to its proper, you know, you could say, at least, well, kind of redirecting it a bit. He was very mm -hmm. important in that because there is a question of continuity and discontinuity and such. And Benedict XVI, I kind of carried this forward a little bit, but JP2, for a long time, um, bringing out the catechism, you yeah. know, so you have a teaching document. So, uh, I'm a big fan of St. Faustina. Um, say, <laughs> let me see. Do I have the card here? Yep. Always you got it on you. I know there. you got it on there you. Go, right, look. So I'm thinking, and he <laughs> obviously loved Faustina as a Polish thing. So he, you know, uh, canonized, canonized her, um, and committed the whole church, the whole world in divine mercy. So mm -hmm. lots of legacy here, obviously, but, um, that's just the start of it. So if you have any questions about the legacy, about popes, this sort of thing, please, uh, chime in. Let's go to first off, uh, Hello. Sparrow Constantine, if I'm pronouncing that correct. Thanks so much. Love him. Uh, who doesn't? Uh, some people don't, but it's, you know, and that's okay. Did he yeah. travel more than most popes? It's, or just seemed like it did. That's a great question. Um, Sparrow, yes, yes he I did mean, travel absolutely. a lot more. Mm -hmm. He did travel a lot more. Now, obviously, um, the pap, in a sense, he kind of redefined the way the papacy is understood. Uh, so, 100%. But the papacy used to be, or at least, I mean, for a long time, the papacy was a kind of bureaucratic thing that Italians did. So it was, you didn't see the Pope that much, you know? I mean, you didn't travel around. Uh, Leo Thirteenth is the first Pope on on video. So you can actually go on YouTube and take, get a clip of uh, Leo the mm -hmm. the end of his pontificate. Um, so he's the first kind of multi media Pope in that way, or at least new media Pope. Um, but traveling was not a big thing, except like the Avignon kind of business. It's just not a thing they did. Uh, JP2 took traveling very seriously. And... Uh, all the time, not just World Youth Day kind of stuff, but visits to countries. He was here. If you could watch, you can watch the the things here from the states. Um, so he's he's always on the move. Um, it sets a standard for popes that uh, maybe one would say. I'm not sure about this sort of thing, but he certainly did travel more and more and more than most, and in a sense, revolutionized what the pope was. He wasn't just this kind of, in a sense, um, magisterial teacher that was in Rome on the chair. But he was the face of Catholicism that was going out to meet the different authorities. He was a prince, but a prince of the world in that way. So, well, one of my one of my favorite, um, I think, titles. I remember this being referred to him. It was he was he was the world's pope, and not like in a bad way, like a worldly pope. He was a, a pope of the world, but like all people saw him as the pope. And and yes, he did travel mostly because you know he became the Pope at a time where international travel was actually quite easy. You know, you got to think many Popes ahead of, before him um, traveling wasn't easy, but it was easy for him. 
and he saw that opportunity and began to travel the world, visit um, countries that had never had a papal visit before, uh, you know, bringing the gospel to different continents and bringing the papacy, I'm sorry, bringing the papacy to different continents. But he became um, this much more dynamic figure, uh, much more accessible figure, which made the church more accessible um, in many respects and started to engage in, um, you know, with other heads of state and, and things of that nature, where before the, the Pope would just write letters and he was this kind of, um, I don't know, anonymous figure behind a piece of paper and a signature. But now you could see his 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 smile. You could hear his voice, his accent. Um, he was he knew what sixteen, seventeen languages or things like that. That he he had this beautiful engagement with um, with the sons and daughters of God on every continent. And I think that's you know we could talk about legacy, and I think that's part of it is that he he opened up um, opened up the world to the person of the vicar of Christ and what that, what that voice has to say, because now it wasn't just, you know, uh, words on paper, but now it was actually directly speaking to you. It was sitting in front of you and uh, it was laughing with you as sharing a meal. Uh, and that, that changes things. And that also opened the world uh, to, to the faith in, in many respects. Um, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Okay. It was, it was great. Let's try uh, Colley Smith. I'm a recent convert. Congratulations. Uh, I'd mm -hmm. love to learn more about JP2. Wonderful. Uh, what books would you recommend? All right. So, Father Joseph Anthony, do you have any uh, books you might recommend? Okay. To um, yes. Uh, shoot. There's, um, I think if you want to get to know JP2 as, probably as, as the Pope, the best thing to read, and it's not easy right out of the gate, but to read a papal encyclical, you know, encyclical mm. readings, its own yeah. uh, genre. So it's not going to be something, you know, easy to get out of the gate. But if you read his first encyclical, Redemptor Hominis, um, mm -hmm. I mean, that sets the tone for the entirety of his papacy. When you talked about his travel, I mean, he was also Pope for 30 some odd years, you know, one of the, the longest um, sitting popes. So that allows him to travel more. But um, it was written, it was his very first encyclical was written at the beginning. And he intentionally writes it as this like program, this optic through which he's going to approach the rest of his papacy. And it's focusing on Christ as the redeemer of man and what that entails and why that's important, how that affects our life, how that affects our individual uh, actions, our beliefs, how that affects our community in that way. So I think it's really important to see that work um, as a kind of an overarch um, of his entire papacy. So to get to know him a little more, to read that work and and kind of see what he's mm -hmm. approaching his papacy as, because that's exactly what he says at the beginning. It's like, this is how I'm going to approach the rest of my papacy is based on this uh, writing. So I think that's yeah. a really good one. Um, if you give me like 30 seconds, I'll look up, but there's a well, book that we get our students. Um, oh, yeah? And I forget, I forget the name of it. And I don't well, want to just, I'm just throw out. Um, so the best biography is a big biography is by uh, George yeah. Weigel. And he's written two of these things, but they're huge. Um, but if you want the full kind of behind the scenes, you could say that's a good, at least from an American perspective. Uh, Edward Sri, uh, mm -hmm. Siri, S-I-R-I, -I, does a lot of like bringing him down to to the level for theology of the body, these kind of things. So Edward, I think I think it's Siri, S-I-R-I. -I. Um, he's a good he's a good man to go to understand theology of the body and some of uh, John Paul II's things. Um the other thing is the encyclicals are the best are the best place to start. You could say even more than the yeah. theology of the body and the mm -hmm. um, love and responsibility. You might, and we could talk about a few of those, of course, and we'll get into them later. But Veritas Splendor is beautiful. Yeah, Fides et Ratio yeah. kind of depends what you're looking for. Um, mm -hmm. uh, he's he's got his social encyclicals are also good. He he started writing encyclical. He started writing. He started the tradition of writing encyclicals as books. So um, <laughs> that's long. so true. They're just, they're just that's long. a great way you know, to put before it. Before that, they were something you could read in a quick sitting. But after JP2, they're just kind of long, but they're beautiful. Uh, DB yeah. says Misericordia, Rich in mm -hmm. Mercy. That's a gorgeous one. I've read that a number of times. He's, I mean, it's in the 20s. My now, He's this is not an encyclical. This is not an encyclical. It's a letter, which is hilarious because that's what an encyclical is, is an encyclical mm -hmm. letter, but it's a few steps down in church document hierarchy. Um, but his letter to artists is one of my favorite um, 
things that he's written. Oh, right. And that's a really, really beautiful letter um, to see the artist as participating in the divine act of creating. And anything the artist does is going to be drawing closer to the creator and yeah. what how the artist depicts and and he says every good and genuine art takes you deeper into humanity because at mm -hmm. the center of humanity is the creator in whose image and likeness we've been created and i love that yeah. idea the other um book and this was something we get uh for our students on um on a regular basis um is a book called pope john paul ii and his five loves Oh. Um, it's by Jason Everett and it kind of talks oh, okay. a little more into okay. like the love that he has for the outdoors, the love that he has for his country, Poland and see how that kind of helped to shape him. The love that he had for arts and poetry and, and, and theater and that stuff. So that, that's a very quick, easy, popular book mm. that, um, can help you understand JP too a little more as well. Yeah, that's great. Um, we'll just take one of these uh, quick one here. Uh, Declan Shaw, Declan Shaw says, uh, Father Bonamager. Have you ever been Eddie Munster for, Munster for Halloween? You know, I, I haven't. Uh, Halloween is coming up, of course. All Saints, uh, All Hallows Eve, you know, All Saints Vigil, I suppose. <laughs> um, I have not been that, but let's, but JP2, uh, let's talk oh, about this in that. <laughs> yeah, uh, how are you going to tie this one in? I no, want to see this talk, real well, quick. He, he talked about the arts. Remember, JP2 was a dramatist. Yeah. Um, so, so. He, he ran in his seminary underground little theater productions. Uh, the Satin uh, Slipper, I think, is his. He he has a play. He's actually written a play. Um, and he would do these no, kind of dramatic. Uh, no, no, Satin Slipper is. Um, yeah, uh, no, no. It's the. Employee, um, right? What is it called? The Jeweler Shop. The Jeweler the Shop. The Jeweler Shop. Yeah. The Jeweler so Shop's these, a play he, that he wrote. Yeah, he's got these plays. He, he cared about drama. And not in the mm -hmm. sense of like he was a dramatic kind of figure of taking advantage of it, but realizing that our bodies matter in mm -hmm. things. And so what's interesting about this is when he develops his understanding of sexual ethics, Catholic sexual teaching, you could say, um, he talks about what's called language of the body. So in theater, you have speaking that you're doing. You're doing talking, particular lines and this, but you're also drawing people and saying and communicating with your body, your gestures, right? This is one of those weird things about COVID is since we've got our faces covered often, we can't actually hear what someone's saying, even though we can hear exactly what they're saying because we can't read their faces, right? right. And so JP2, in his understanding of, of the human person, as not just kind of a thinking thing, but as an embodied, an embodied person, right, who has flesh and blood, and therefore communicates not just through one's words and mental images, but through one's activities and through one's bodily gestures and actions. And he says, this is the language of the body. So how you use your body with other people tells and communicates truths to them um so that's part of his earlier upbringing with the the drama aspect of things and it carries through in the way that he develops his theology and an account of the moral teachings and also the, the just the value of liturgy it reminded me oh yeah when i think about like the language of the body it's not just in sexuality but it's anything so that mm -hmm. our communication when people get excited about catholics as kind of ritualistic people sitting kneeling standing praying all these physical gestures we have and it's like well that's you know i just want to talk to god's you know one what's well, like yeah that's how you talk to god because that's how i talk to other people i do it mm -hmm. with my body i do it through how i look expressions um, my touch, all this stuff. And that's going to be important. So that's the that language of the body stuff, dr dramatism and uh, Halloween costumes. Okay. Yeah. I mean, what is it? Psychologists say that like 98% of communications nonverbal it's done with body language. No idea. It, sure. Yeah. Makes sense. I, that's a, that's a stat that I make up on a regular basis. It's always 90 yeah. something. I don't know. It changes in Probably whatever right. day I feel like. You know, so today, ninety eight percent. Why not? Um, but it's right. that bodily oh. communication. You know, it's that body language. That's we use that all the time. Oh, look at their body language. He's standing. He's got his arms crossed and all that stuff. CIA officials read body language all the time during interrogations or whatnot. Um, this is not nothing like we, we kind of overcomplicate it, but like we, it's it's as part of who we are. Yeah. All right, let's take one from uh, Ms. LeClaire. Uh, considering the don't judge me chanting we're hearing from the other side, quotation marks, well, I'm not sure which side, but yeah, fair enough. Um, how do we approach with the truth in a way that we can be heard? I think this question is asking, um, considering that today there's this like no judgment, there's a judgment mm -hmm. prohibition on things, 
Um, how do we approach those who say don't agree with Catholic? I'm going to assume this is about sexual teaching um, and this sort of, or just truth, the harder truths you could say, because it's, it, it's yep. if it's not a judgmental truth, it won't be a problem. So, uh, Father Joseph, I think you did a lot of uh, campus ministry stuff. Yeah. I mean, you, detract, you teach, of course, you give these books on JP2. Obviously, JP2, <laughs> at least in the college world, I mean, I've, I've taught RCA stuff doing this as well, but uh, how do you... Yeah, how do you how do you say something such that people can hear it for mm -hmm. what it is and not what it's not? I think you have to be able to win the ability to be heard. Like you have to win the right for them to listen to you. And sometimes that's hard. Um, sometimes that means you have to be patient and uh, allow them to speak and say, okay, where are you? Because a lot of times, you know, this is, you know, if we're jumping popes now, this is a lot of what Pope Francis talks about as accompaniment. Um, and mm -hmm. we see it also in the life of Jesus all the time that he quote unquote meets people where they are. And I think for a lot of that is he allows, um, we have to allow people to speak first so that we have, have an idea of where they're, where they are, where, mm -hmm. where they're, uh, what is influencing them, where their hurt is instead of coming on strong out the gate and just preaching at people or where we think they what we think they believe and so mm -hmm. i think um being able to be a little more patient with people um and that gives us the ability to win trust that we're not going to just preach at them to then win them over because i think far too much of uh discussions nowadays are just arguments in order to win well mm -hmm. how, what's the goal here well i want them on my side i have the truth i know what is right and it's you know it's church teaching. There's a reason it's articulated the way it is, is to help guide us, um, not to punish us, is to guide us towards the truth and the good, uh, ultimately our salvation. And so we can hold firm and fast to that, but um, the whole goal isn't to win them over to this. The goal is to allow them to, um, to experience joy and happiness and ultimately the freedom that only Christ can offer in our life. And so it takes some time to actually be patient. And I think one of the first things that we can do is actually listen first instead yeah, of I, talk. No, that, that's a good, that's a good point. There's, um, we automatically, I think at least I do, I don't automatically project into that other person, mm -hmm. um, what I would be thinking if I believed what they hear. Like if it was basically me, but anti-Catholic or anti jp 2 <laughs> or anti whatever. And, and the fact of the matter is I've never met anyone that's just me, but the opposite. Right, and I have a twin brother, um, but like I haven't met anyone who's just the opposite. Um, I mean, so that I, anytime I do that projection, I remind myself like that's just not true. I'm just doing that because that's psychologically how we deal with people. So one thing is, yeah, trying to hear first about who is this person and where are they coming from. Mm -hmm. The second thing, perhaps, is I think we could do better at being less surprised. Uh, I'm sorry, at being more surprised. <laughs> that people don't take this, the teaching seriously. Like we have this sense of, we know this is tough topics. I remember when I was teaching on Catholic sexuality at, at Providence college, I showed a picture of like an airplane in turbulence and like a, a seatbelt sign that went on. Is it okay? Hold on everybody. We're going to go in some rough waters here, but and we, we can, there is rough water here, but we should also, I think have confidence in just presenting, just presenting the truth. Not a sense of like, this is special and you don't believe in this stuff and you're actually a bad person because of this, but perhaps they've never really heard this thing and to be shocked at the fact that people think like, oh, this is crazy. Be like, oh, I don't, yeah. I don't know. I've always thought like when you say I love you to someone, you really mean a commitment to that, that you want to share forever, um, that it has to be unique and this sort of thing and that it should be open to life and that I don't like kind of hide back and forth from certain things and I don't, you know, so that we we could be more bemused perhaps as we should be. Because if we're not if we're not shocked that people reject the teaching, then I wonder if we just believe it because we're told to believe it, or whether we've mm -hmm. like internalized it yet. You know, just like if if you if someone said, "Well, prove to me that other other minds exist," I've had this happen, <laughs> and I mean, like I have to. I'm like, oh yeah, sure, that's normal. I I've all I always think I wonder if other people exist or if it's just me. You know, no, it's like shock. It's like wait now, hold on a second. You don't think you exist, really? Why not? Like, what, mm -hmm. what is the deal with that? Why don't you think you exist? What are those arguments? Because I just doesn't, it doesn't occur to me. This seems yeah. so obvious that I exist and I'd have to be crazy not to think that. And maybe if we could think more, or at least as like a swing thought, you could say, or an attitude of Catholic sexual teaching, perhaps, and kind of like, wait a minute. Oh, you don't believe that marriage is 
between a man and woman indissoluble? I mean, I okay, why not? Like, it seems like it is. Um, mm-hmm. You wait, you wait, you believe now you're not going to have a contraception discussion probably with a random stranger or something, but <laughs> would someone go, oh, yeah, I don't know. I just have always thought that, you know, it seems strange to kind of like cut out part of the process. That seems, you know, like I'm, I'm yes to you, but not entirely yes. I'm kind of like partial yes to you. That yeah. sounds like a weird way of talking about love, you know, and not in like a judgmental way, but more of like a bemused, like, tell me why you don't believe this. This is fascinating. You know? Right. Yeah. And, that, and that's where I think like we could we could do a lot better if we actually took the disposition to listen first and say like, OK, I know that we disagree on this. Like, it's very clear you don't believe um, some aspects of, Catholic, of of sexual teaching or sexual morality uh, than I do. But let's figure this out. And then if you're like, let's let's figure this out together. OK, like I'm going to stand shoulder shoulder. We're going to go towards the truth here. Um so let, where where are you and where do you stand on this? And that that kind of like breaks down some of those defenses and breaks down mm-hmm. some of those barriers. If you're like, okay, let's figure this out here. Um, and then you kind of start to, f- I, I, what I've always found is if you can start to establish where you guys, where you do agree with somebody, you know, find some common ground, then that's like a, a much more inviting conversation than a very um, contentious battle. Where it's like, mm. I'm just talking at this person, lobbying grenades, lobbying grenades. But it's like, okay, let's find some common ground where we do agree. Because I am I know you like you enjoy people. I enjoy people. Like You think people should be happy. I agree with that too. So let's find some common ground first from where we can both stand. And then from that commonality, see where we start to diverge instead of starting to focus on the contentious conflict where we're already worlds apart. Yeah, that's true. Okay. All right, now I'm going to butcher your name, Jada. It's Jada Braxma. Um, I, I, so I apologize about that. Um, but you say, I'm a Protestant. Jada says, I'm a Protestant who has recently felt drawn to the Catholic Church. However, I struggle to accept the Church's systematic practice of praying to the saints. What is your defense of prayer to the saints? That's a great question, Jada. Yeah. Um, uh, I'm a convert myself. Um, and this was an this was this was an issue. Of course, I thought this was true. so. A lot of the things you find out as a as a Protestant as a, when you're thinking about Catholicism is that uh, Catholics don't believe what you think they believe. Um, it's actually usually a lot more reasonable. Um, so that's and I think that's true with, with the saints as well. Um, so, Joseph Anthony, what are you what what are your first thoughts on um, when someone says I, I praying to the saints is 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 weird? I don't understand the Catholic practice. What do you usually? What do you usually say? Um, I, I talk about when we look at our kind of family relationships and, and friendships that we have, um, that we very regularly ask our friends to help us with things, whether that's, you know, we're moving apartments, we need help carrying a, a couch or something like that. Or we we ask um, family members, maybe their older brothers and sisters or aunts and uncles for like some advice and guidance, like, hey, I'm starting this new job. How, you know, what's your advice on these types of things? Um if we understand that kind of relationship and see that we as the body of Christ, when somebody dies and no longer their their time on earth is done, we continue to have those relationships, right? With the, there's a beautiful line in the, Catholic, uh, in the funeral liturgy of a Catholic funeral that says, you know, life has changed, it has not ended. And so because we share in this unity of this mystical body of Christ, we are one, uh, in this mystical body of Christ, both on earth and in heaven, um, we can ask for the assistance, the guidance, the help of those friends who are our, our saints who have gone before us, you know, and that they're not restricted uh, towards generations or things of those nature. So we can continually have those. In, um, and that's what prayer to saints is, is asking for their help, assistance, petitions mm. that they can then turn to the Lord and, and um, ask for additional graces to help us through a tough time or whatever the situation may be. So I think when, when I talk about it, I, I try to frame it in the relationships that we are uh, used to experiencing or very common for us and show how that this one, um, this one event, which is death, doesn't necessarily preclude us from sustaining those types of relationships if we proclaim the, the fact that Christ has risen from the dead and that we share in that resurrection via our baptism, then we can mm. continually um, interact with the saints who have gone before us in that manner. Yeah, and I think this is it, it's a great question, and it reminds us, I think, of our presuppositions 
that we assume the difference between death and bodily death, I guess. Um, mm-hmm. And we have in modernity, we have it's just natural. We and we talk I mean, even COVID is all just talk about death and death is it. We <laughs> I think we can feel like that death is that's it's it. And whatever's after it, who knows? Uh, and we can't these sort of things. But the traditional conception, at least for for Westerners and for most people is th- thinking philosophically, is that uh, bodily death is just bodily death. That you are uh, an immortal soul. You know, whatever we can deal with the metaphysics of this later. But that 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 you don't end as a human being um, when you when you die. This just you know, there's reasons to think this is true uh, for all sorts of philosophical reasons, and just from self experience, I can imagine myself not having a this body or that body. So. Um, there's good philosophical arguments for it, what have you. And then the second thing, though, is to take. So let's assume that let's assume that there is an afterlife. Let's assume that's the case. Um, and then second thing is let's assume that prayer matters and that prayer works, right? I mean, and that's a big assumption when you think about it. I mean, when I ask Father Joseph Anthony to pray for me, what am I? What am I doing? I'm asking him yeah. to, to petition God to do something, right? Well, does God already know that? Okay, big questions here. But if we assume that that's, if we assume that 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 he can pray for me. And we assume that when someone dies, that it's bodily death, and that you're, but they're, they're still alive in in some fashion, right? Which is the Christian teaching. Uh, no matter what, you know, Protestants believe this. Although Calvin, we have this kind of soul sleep waiting. But if <laughs> prayer is something, asking someone to pray for you, and if this, if you don't die when you die, shall we say, um, then praying for the saints is just asking popular friends. To do to to do the same thing that your friends in here do, and I think Father Joseph Anthony rightly puts it in terms of the family. Catholics have a big family mentality. Like we yeah. we just see ourselves related to each other, which is the great thing about Catholicism. Because anywhere you go in the world, oh you can go yeah. into mass and you are actually at home. It's like you're at the dinner table at the same. You know all the rituals, you know all the routines, you know when you stand up, when you sit. Everything's the same. You you've joined a huge family that's universal. And in that way, you've not only joined a family that's universal horizontally, but also in a sense vertically and through time that you're connected to those people before so that you can be friends with St. Thomas More. Now, the friendship of St. Thomas More, my friendship with, say, St. Faustina, you could say, is different than my friendship with Saint jo- with Father Joseph Anthony Kress, who's not yet St. Joseph Anthony Kress, but we'll see. <laughs> Working um, on it. Nonetheless, both of them are people. I have it on good authority that St. Faustina existed as a person and Joseph mm-hmm. Anthony ex- is a person. And so both of them w- will live forever in some fashion or other. And since they're humans and humans can pray, then intercession of the saints and asking them to do that is just an extension of the family model. It's not praying to them as like demigods or any sort of thing. It's just people who are a little bit closer to, uh, you could say, the source of uh, the source of grace and assistance. If prayer is like unleashing something, <laughs> uh, they're just a little bit closer to it as opposed to us who are a little farther away. And they're a little more attentive too. That's the teaching, I guess. That's what I'd say. All right. Yeah. Um, we've got uh, Spiro Constantine says, how best can we honor his legacy? Uh, that How best can we honor St. John Paul II's legacy? Um, oh, that's a great, that's a great question. I mean, this tell is... Tell a friend. Um, <laughs> yeah, tell a friend. I, I think... Being able to, you know, read read his works, and I, I think that's that's one of his great um, gifts, and, and they're going to be perennial. You know, whether it's his encyclicals or his plays, I have a book of his poetry. It's a book called "Place Within His Poetry," um, which is beautiful. And um, but not being afraid to, I think, kind of love humanity. And love, um, you know, like he said, I, I fell in love with human love and not being afraid to love humanity and love the living this life in its fullness. You see all the some of the best pictures are him, you know, in the mountains hiking um, in and he he loved the outdoors and those types of things. And I think just being able to um, engage in those kind of human endeavors. Uh, I think that's part of what what that is. And if we can honor his legacy in any way is pretty much what every, you know, um, member of a religious institute would do is that they imitate Christ by imitating their founder. You know, that's what we do with St. Dominic, right? We talk about how, you know, we imitate 
Christ by imitating Saint as Saint Dominic imitated Christ. You know, we follow in those footsteps, and I think um, every member of a religious order carries that kind of responsibility to further and honor the legacy of their founder, their of their religious institute, is to then imitate that founder as he was called to imitate the Lord in a unique way. Um, I think JP2 has a very huge and um, wide influence, but to honor him is, is possibly just to imitate him as he imitated Christ. So love the Blessed Virgin Mary, take her as your, your oh, own yeah, kind of spiritual yeah. mother, um, love human love, um, love the arts, love uh, nature and creation, and, and see the gift of the person that is in front of you each and every time. Um, to dive into, you know, the beauties of scripture and philosophy and theology, like all of those things, you can kind of ro roll into it together. But that's yeah. maybe the best way to say it. And I would, I'll give one, I'll give one concrete uh, way, and then I'll give one kind of uh, attitudinal way. You could say concrete way. Um, reading his first homily the be not afraid homily um, oh, that's, yes. that's actually uh, for the church for those of us who are who are in, uh, committed to saying the, the, the divine office um that's the reading for it that's given um you can go on uc usccb and you can find this and that first it's the homily on his election of, of the pope i think it is and that's a beautiful open wide doors to christ be not afraid mm -hmm. this sort of thing that's a beautiful kind of it's set the agenda for his his mission so reading that and then and then his legacy about how to play that out in a sense of, I, I do think sometimes we get over concerned or we're, we, we break into camps and sects and sort of mm -hmm. things. And we get who's in, who's out and sort of, and JP two, he had this like boldness. It was a shocking thing that he went out. And even though, for instance, like Carl, Carl uh, Rahner or Hans Kuhn, for instance, not particularly inclined to JP two, uh, he wasn't worried about that. He just went, um, and one in front of people because he had he felt like he had the truth to proclaim and he was the teacher and he was the shepherd. And so there's just a boldness. He wasn't afraid of Catholicism and he wasn't afraid of modernity and he wasn't afraid of the things. He just went and conquered things for Christ. So a less, you could say, less anxiety, perhaps, and less politicization. We just we can. I think part of his legacy is not worrying about the politics of things as much. Not that it's not important and you have to draw lines at some point, but that in some ways we're all members of the same family and that we can be bold about the truth and not feel partisan about it. And that's mm -hmm. part of, I think that's part of his legacy is doing that. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. Uh, this one is from Matthew Pine, uh, Matt Pine. I, I don't know. <laughs> Do I know Matt Pine? Um, I, I've so, heard of him before. I think since yeah. we're talking JP two, I'm going to drop a TOB. It's the theology of the body for those around the inside um, question in here. What are valid reasons for a married couple to avoid uh, pregnancy through NFP? So NFP is, so he's just JP two T O B N F P A S A P whatever. Um, so so Matthew, the Matthew Pine uh, as N F P is natural family planning, natural family planning, um, and that's in so that's the alternative to say con artificial contraception and such. So Humani Vitae yep. comes out and says uh, natural family planning is kind of you can you can plan for your family, but you have to do it mm -hmm. naturally. And then the question is, well, what does that mean? And it means spacing out pregnancies. Um, if you want without using artificial means and then there's different methods Crichton method and others what have you a different way and it gets it can get complicated and you can start to think my gosh am i just <laughs> am i just, i think this is what matthew pine question is which is a good question am i just contracepting but in a permittable yeah. way like how how is natural family planning different from contraception uh there should be some difference it's not just like it's an omission as opposed to a commission of something, I think. Um, but that's the question. So, Father Joseph Anthony, how you want to tackle? Um, wh what's I mean, going on here? Listen, I'm I'm going to I'm going to be very honest. I'm, I'm this is basically a cop out, but like, it's got to be prudence with the couple. Like, I mean, the couple has to look. There's so many circumstances that are unique to each couple's, um, you know, marriage and and state of life and and what's happening with their family. Uh, and things that like it's I, I get this question a lot in marriage prep and it's kind of one of the biggest non-answers that I can give but the reality is like each each opportunity is different and you might delay a pregnancy at the beginning of marriage and and you know the spacing out might be different uh, after the first or second child or a little further down the road because circumstances change and I would just encourage a couple and this is where I talk to our couples about mm -hmm. growing in the virtues, all of them, 
growing in prudence, justice, temperance, and fortitude in, in faith, hope, and charity. And that if they can uh, grow in those virtues and be virtuous people, when it comes to make those types of big decisions, then they'll be, they'll be making virtuous decisions there. Mm -hmm. But I think if it's like, well, then like, we'll just, I need a direct, um, you know, blueprint. And is this on the okay list or is this on the not okay list? It kind of, I mean, you just, I've seen um, married couples in, you know, the health of each spouse changes and, and there's so many different circumstances and factors that go into play with this. Like it really is mm -hmm. just a prudential decision. And it's, uh, it's hard to say this, you know, um, unattached from those circumstances mm -hmm. that there's yeah. any, that these are appropriate reasons and these are non appropriate reasons. It's yep. no, and that's just kind and, of a and, prudence. Right. And I'm sure. And Matt, of course, Matthew Pine knows, knows this. He's asking, it's a great question to, to ask because I think even raising the question is really important. Well, yes, someone might that, say that I agree with, yeah. a, 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 you know, maybe a concept, a conception mentality, practice NFP with a conception mentality or something. I think people have heard this before. Um, so raising the, asking yourself the question of like, what is my, what are our real aims here um, with this? And then the prudence question of, okay, what are, because the church, now you could, there's diversity of opinion, of course, you know, um, that you could say, um, I'm just, we're not going to practice any natural family planning. Our natural family planning is to not worry about it and mm -hmm. do supernatural planning, let God figure out how, to, how it works. And that's perfectly fine. The church, the church doesn't say, no, you've got to space your pregnancies. <laughs> the church says, yeah. do, you know, do what, do what is good. And for some people, they feel like, no, I have, I, I just don't feel comfortable. I feel like I'm saying no to God for that. And if that's where you're at, boom, you know, 20 kids or who knows it's up to God, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, but you could, but the church also says in Humana Vitae that there are reasons why you would delay pregnancy, um, for all the prudential reasons that Father Joseph Anthony talked about. So it allows for that. And then of course, the rubber comes, the, it meets in the road with your, maybe your confessor, um, talking to each other about things, but knowing that there are legitimate w times or reasons to space to space births, um, but then figuring out what they are and such, it's important just to ask yourself the question: um, Am I practicing NFP as a con as a form of contraception, and is there or I mean, something else? But even then, I don't like that kind of. I'm not I sure yeah. I love that language either because if you're practicing NFP, you're not doing contraception at all. Like mm -hmm. you could even the mentality language isn't right, but it is. It is true that you we can take this is the sinfulness of man, right? Uh, we can take even good things and turn them to turn them against uh, the good. So it's possible to to do almost anything in a bad way. Um, so perhaps that's there as well. Okay, um, let's go. Ooh, a Texas gentleman. Well, that's just repeating <laughs> itself, isn't it? Um, <laughs> Texas gentleman says, "Any thoughts you all want to share about the awesome Father Benedict Groeschel?" Yes. Um, uh, he had a great beard. He was a Franciscan. Um, yeah, God I'm just thinking him. of all the facts. Yeah, he was fantastic. Um, I loved him. And and to be honest, um, not a uh, will he be a canonized saint? I fear not because of yeah. um, because of late because of unpleasantness in the current contemporary mindset that got him in trouble. When I now I don't know all the cases, but it doesn't seem like he did anything wrong per se. This stuff happens. Um, and he seems like he got short end of a stick on something. At least his legacy was tarnished for no good reason. It's different than say Jean Vanier, mm -hmm. who it seems like, Whoa, okay. Serious problems here. That man <laughs> is probably not going to get canonized as far as I can tell. But father Grishel, um, I, I watched father Grishel before I was Catholic. Uh, I remember I was teaching at a Baptist, uh, before I went to even Anglican seminary, I was teaching at a Baptist high school and he had this Bible show he went on EWTN. I would watch it at night as a Protestant. This this friar wearing this nice big beard and this gray habit. And get your Bibles. Always get your Bible. You know what? <laughs> and I was fantastic. I loved him. I think he was, he, he had, there's something about him that drew in Protestants, even before, say, Bishop Barron. I think Bishop Barron is yeah. kind of the version now. But he was great. <laughs> and also, he was a psychologist. So he knew yeah. how the human psyche works. He has a great book. I think it's called Spiritual Passages. Um, which is very helpful to thinking through the differences between psychology and spirituality mm -hmm. and the interconnections with them, uh, with confession and psychology and this kind of stuff. And it's a beautiful developmental book account by an Orthodox Catholic uh, priest who is, is wonderful. So I, I, I think he's great. Uh, obviously, I have a soft spot for Franciscans. So he's one of my, he's one of my favorites. Yeah. And I haven't thought about Father 
Benedict Rochelle. In I know a while. That. That's been a while. That's a name I haven't heard in a while. Well, we had, I actually we I our, met him. One of our classmates. Oh, did you? I met him once. Um, okay. It was it was shortly before he passed away. He was um, speaking at one of the summer conferences at Francisco University in Steubenville, where I was a, a college student, and I was working. I was in charge of the liturgy committee, so I was working, and we had one of our kind of like team staff dinner things. And uh, at the end of the the dinner, I went up next to him, and it was interesting because he always traveled with another friar, and that his number two would just sit and pray the rosary constantly for him. It was just like he would sit off stage, and all th that guy's responsibility was to you know, drive him around, take care of his health and his travel, but just to pray the rosary. And I found that so inspiring. But yeah, I remember when I met him, he asked me, you know, what are you doing with your life, basically? And I said, well, actually, I'm uh, applying to the Dominicans. And he was so excited. He's like, in New York City, out of all the old orders, they're the ones I trust the most. And I was just like, took such great comfort. And he had just a wonderful um inviting presence but just a, it was a great experience so big fan of him yeah that's great and uh david the hermit uh fantastic andrew apostle father andrew apostle is a good priest too that's absolutely right i don't know him as well as i i don't as I, yeah I know you know but um but yeah all those guys i mean god bless them love the working, cfrs they're working like, City big fans of that, cfrs yeah that's great. over here um, um also brother isaiah his music has been like a constant soundtrack for me in the last mm -hmm. three months you know, yeah. shout out to one of my students, Olivia, who sent me his music. I was like, you need to listen to this. And it's a phenomenal. It's like Jack Johnson praying the litany of Loretto is basically what that is, which both there of those go. things are stuff I love. So, yeah, yeah, big fans of CFRs. All right. Jacob DeVos says JP2 came of age in turbulent times. That's true. Although it seems like we keep turbulent times continue on um, yeah. to say the least. But he was so full of hope. That's that is indeed true. How can mm -hmm. we live the virtue of hope uh, and be not afraid in our times? Now, that's uh, Jacob, that's a great question. And one I think about, the virtue of hope is, I wonder if that's the least practiced of the theological virtues. At least, maybe I'm just speaking from my own personal experience. But faith, of course, <laughs> we think about this is really important. And then charity, you try to practice this, but you're intending. But I don't, I don't often think about like asking for the virtue of hope, for developing the virtue, practicing, working on the virtue of hope, inculcating it, making it a hobby to us, all this kind of stuff. Um, because the virtue of hope is 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 not just like wishing the best. You know, no. it's it's I mean, and that's part of the the vision of JP2 was trusting in the providence of God and having hope, not because mm -hmm. just he was had a sunny disposition, for instance. Some people are just naturally optimistic, you could say, but hope isn't optimism. Optimism no. is like a psychological kind of thing, um, but hope is is a virtue that develops on uh, looking for well, yeah, for the desired um, and expecting, but not expecting in the sense of like knowing ahead of time, but you know trusting in it, the substance of things hoped for, and all this language of Hebrews eleven. But it's a th it is a gift, it's theological, yeah. and so it's given. But not only that, but it's also anchored. So it's given by God. Um, and we have natural, there's natural hope, of course, um, but it's, it's, it's given by God, the true, the true sense of hope, but it's also anchored in God such that we don't, it's not that God gives us hope that we then see the world correctly and we can hope in it, but rather hope is something that we get from God and develop with God and always stays with God. So yeah. we, we hope because he is faithful, not because we have any sense of this thing. I think it's like, I, I appreciate so much the fact that you said like hope is not like Christianity's version of optimism. It's not like, oh, the glass is half full, but I'm going to sprinkle in some Jesus and now I have the virtue of hope. Like that is not what that is. Um, hope is, it's a theological virtue, right? Which means it's a gift. And unlike the other acquired virtues, you can't just keep you know forcing yourself to be hopeful. You have to mm -hmm. receive it as a gift. And that initiates at our baptism and then continues mm -hmm. to grow. Also, with it being a theological virtue, there's no upper limit. With the other virtues, you can either go to excess or defect or, or deficiency. With the mm -hmm. theological virtues, you can't, there's no excess. You can't hope too much. But with the, with you saying always like stays with God is, you know, um hope is as is is God. Mm -hmm. Providence okay, well. of God 
is 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 continually happening, right? Mm. So it's God as He has promised us. So I think if you, what I encourage people that is, if you struggle with hope, and it's not easy to hope. Like you look around us and you're like, really, this is God's providence. Like this is what He's, you know, making happen. But if you struggle with that, like read the Gospels, read His promises. You know, behold, I will be with you always until the end of age. You know, I go to prepare a place for you and I will come back and bring you to myself. Like these are the promises and he's always faithful to his promises. So if you struggle with hope or if it's hard to hope and you want to grow in that virtue, um, read the gospels with that kind of optic or a lens to the promises that the Lord makes to us and know that he's always faithful to that. Yeah, and I think... Um, just one more thing is it's not just the hope, and this isn't just for hope around the world, is, is but also for our own in our own sinfulness. I tell people yes. in the confessional, yeah. especially, that the virtue of hope is a great antidote uh, when you leave the confessional after being absolved to to stay on track. That you can have hope from God, that you can conquer the sins that you've probably been confessing for a while. That never despair about this, not because you're going to do better uh, on your own strength, but that you will be able to practice hope make it internalize it from Christ as he brings you those graces. So it's a beautiful, very practical, not just for the world situation, but also for your own like life to be hopeful that you can achieve sanctity. But there's like one more thing. And now we're like getting back to JP two, And um, I'm in the middle of planning a pilgrimage to Poland for our students next summer. We did it a few years ago. And one of the most important things to know is I think the Polish people are very hopeful people. And like talking about JP too, like they've seen so much and especially through the 20th century, you know, they were still able to con retain their hope. And that message of divine mercy, I, I don't think is an accident. It's very intentional that the Lord gave the message of divine mercy to this Polish nun, S Sister Faustina, right? Mm -hmm. And because hope and trust are always in tandem with each other. You know, to to trust in the Lord is to be a hopeful person. Yeah, and yeah. knowing uh, a, a people, a, a country has been beaten down so much that they needed to reiterate their trust and hope in the Lord. I think is um, they always go together. So that's something else is like the trust and hope of each other. But yeah, let's yeah. roll for and, the next one. We're running, we're running out of, of uh, time uh, here, but let's do this one. Um, St. John Paul II <laughs> is my hero too, like you all. That's fantastic. But I wonder who were his heroes in his time, especially in the field of theology and philosophy. Well, philosophy, of course, he was trained in Lublin Thomism, which was a phenomenological school of Thomism. So he was a, he was a student of philosophically wise uh, Edmund Husserl, um, not directly, but from that phenomenological method. Um, and so Edith Stein was someone he was very close to, of course, because Edith Stein was a direct student to so Teresa Benedict of the Cross of of uh, Edmund Husserl, among others. Um, theologically, uh, well, the field of theology, I guess the biggest would be St. John of the Cross. Um, yeah. he's, if, so if you look actually in the theology yeah. of the body, in the, um, the the newer edition, it should be it should have a thing from Wallstein, introduction by, from Michael Wallstein. Uh, about 100 pages. It's a nice, it's a big, big, it's like a book itself. It's beautiful. And he ties in the the cross and the and um, St. John of the Cross, the Carmelite spirituality, to what JP2 is trying to do. So JP2 has a Carmelite kind of essence to him. A final thing, though, I should say is he was a big fan of uh, of Odo Cassell, who most people yeah. probably don't know that much, but um, mm -hmm. a German monk, a uh, Benedictine, who talked about the mysteries of the Eucharist and the and the liturgy as yep. being a reenactment at the same time as the cross itself. So um, he calls it Mysterian Gegenwart, the mysterious presence in German. Um, and so if you look at JP2's let, stuff about the Eucharist and the catechism, um, and then also in his encyclicals, you have a very beautiful sense of that the Eucharist is not um, just a pure memory of something, no. but it's rather the moment on Golgotha Two planes, the divine human plane is once again united because the same person is there in both times. And it gets a little, you could say, mystical, but I think JP2 does a good job pointing it off. And it's a beautiful reflection on what's happening. It is a side note. Um, you'll notice some priests take off their their watches for the for the Eucharist. And part of that's because it's, it's weird and you have a, a big silver shiny thing when you're holding up the host. But part of it because for me it's it's my watch is wrong. My watch will be wrong during that time. Mm -hmm. uh, because it's 3 p.m on Good Friday. And so my, unless I'm celebrating the Eucharist on Friday at 3 p.m., my watch is wrong. So it's a reminder to me that this is not just a sort of a remembered past event. Um, 
but that I would say that that those are some influences there uh, to look into or to think about, but especially the Carmelite tradition uh, that he worked with. Um, so that's what we have to say about John Paul II. We're basically out of time here, but perhaps uh, Father Joseph Anthony, do you have any final comments or thoughts about JP two? Um, <laughs> I think the fi final thoughts and comments are getting back to um, what you mentioned earlier, but it's just that there's nothing taken away when we um, wake up every day and dedicate our lives to the Lord. And, you know, JP2 talks You're about afraid. that total, yep. total gift of self, you know, in the spousal union and just the act of love is self-sacrificial and it's total, it's exclusive. But, um, you know, when we can, we can do that, uh, and, and make the gift of ourself and give ourselves to following Jesus Christ, he takes nothing away from us and he returns yeah. to us, our humanity, he returns to us, our freedom, um, our beauty, our, you know, all the joys and pleasures and virtues, and he returns to us everything that we are. Um, so the last things I would say is that that's a perennial teaching and JP two articulated it in such a beautiful way, but we can do that each and every day, um, and following yep. his, his example. Well, there we go. Uh, so live explaining hour gone by talking about JP two. Uh, you got the backbenchers today, the real guys are coming <laughs> back. I hope in the next one. Yeah. But, I was going to say next week they'll be here. <laughs> Joseph Anthony and I, well, who knows what happened, but uh, we're delighted to be with you. If uh, like, and do whatever that kind of this normal podcast kind of stuff, have a great uh, weekend. And uh, if you get a chance to celebrate something of JP two, whether it's just a quick prayer to him asking for assistance and for, for hope and courage, or if it's reading his, his first letter or his first homily or something, please do that. No, we'll be praying for you. Pray for us and have a great weekend and God bless.